All right. Welcome back to Essential Perturbation Theory and Asymptotic Analysis. Um, are there any questions before we get started? How's the homework progressing? Anybody give the shot? Nobody? Okay. Well, it sounds like it's not impossible or no one believes it's impossible. So last time we were talking about a corner layer problem and uh, we derived a, a an exact solution to this problem. The solutions looked like this. Now, the solutions that I'm showing here are only approximate solutions and they're obtained using our asym mass asymptotic expansion methods. And so we'll get to that construction momentarily. The equation that we want to solve, uh, I guess I need to go back to that, is, um, is this one, subject to these boundary conditions. The problem with applying our standard theory is that this p function here is uh, has a simple zero in the domain of interest, minus one to one. In fact, it's uh, got a simple zero at x equals zero, as we said here. And so we can't use our, we had a pretty standard little simple proposition that told us where we could find the boundary conditions. That no longer holds, or sorry, where we would find the boundary layer. That no longer holds. We don't know what the boundary layer thickness is. We don't know much actually. And so uh, in this example, we need to more or less derive everything for ourselves again. Now, this is in way of review because we made it as far as to construct that analytic solution and then also um, you know, observe that uh, asymptotically in this in this region, the solution was roughly linear, and in this region, the, the solution was roughly linear. I think we said that here it's roughly minus x, and here it's roughly 2x. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we, want to, we want to approach this problem from a slightly different point of view using matched asymptotic uh, expansions. So that's what we're doing in this, this new example. I didn't repeat the... Uh, ODE and boundary conditions, they're exactly the same as they were in the previous one. We expect now, um, based on a remark that I made after, um, well, in, in the previous slide deck, 5.1 or 5-1, I made a remark that said, well, we can't apply the theory that we have for these previous two propositions, but we could probably modify it to say that if we have a simple zero in the domain, let's say at x equals zero, then we can show that we maybe have a boundary layer at that point. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. So this is only a plausibility argument. Um, we don't necessarily know that this is gonna work out. We can see here that um, it's gonna work out, but there are still some extra complications that don't really obey the standard theory. In any case, if you believe that remark, we expect to have a trans transition layer at x equals zero. Of course, we just saw the exact solution, if you believe this is a reasonable exact solution, and it looks like there's something going on here at x equals zero. It's not exactly a boundary layer in the usual sense. It's uh, a new kind of boundary layer. In fact, it's what we call a corner layer. So we started this, uh, this is a review from last time because we, we made it a few slides in. So the first thing we did was we assumed that our outer solution had a standard expansion in uh, the standard power series in epsilon, right? Integral powers of epsilon. And, as, and we said, this should be valid as long as we stay away from x equals zero. So that's these two regions. So that's essentially two outer regions if you're counting. So we have x equals zero in the middle x equals one, x equals minus one. And we're gonna assume that our expansions are valid as long as you stay away from 
the boundary layer, x equals zero. So that's what this domain omega represents, or omega out. It's, it's uh, essentially the region which stays away from the boundary layer, whatever this thing is. Now, if we plug this into the solution and do our usual regular uh, perturbation series methods or regular perturbation expansion methods, we find that the leading order term or the leading order equation is this, which is satisfied in the outer solution regions. We argued last time that the solutions for this, it's fairly easy to see, uh, should be y naught equals a constant times x. It's uh, easy to see that. Uh, if you put in y naught equals a constant times x, you get this minus this is, is clearly zero. So um, we argued then that based on our boundary conditions, we should probably have, or we should have for our two outer solutions, we should have minus x and two x. Remember there are two outer regions. We're not saying that this is a uh, leading order and then the first order correction. These are both leading order solutions, but in the various solution domains. So this one is in the outer region on the left-hand side, and this one is in the outer region on the right-hand side or to the right of the boundary layer. Now we can show, though I didn't write any of the details here for this, that the solution to all other orders, all corrections, k equals one, two, three, et cetera, are zero for all values of k in the outer solution regions. So on the right-hand side, the left-hand side, all of the correction terms are zero, exactly. So in fact, it really doesn't matter whether we write this in as, as a power series expansion and integral powers of epsilon or epsilon to the one half, it doesn't really matter, okay? Epsilon uh, k by two or k by three or k by four, it doesn't matter because only the leading order term survives. Question? The weak formula, the weak formula we need to separate the discussion of, of like the left hand side of the region, right hand side of the region. Yeah. So we will find that we really do have to be careful about the left hand side and the right hand side. And um and it and it and it will uh, at the end we'll find that it kind of washes out you and it, and it seems like actually we didn't have to really distinguish but um before we get to that point we have to be very careful about distinguishing whether we're on the left side or the right side you're on negative one and two like the coefficient of x is essentially you plug it into the left hand boundary and the right hand right hand boundary and solve for the c zero zero. exactly yeah that's all we're doing there you're just solving for c zero zero and in one hand you're finding it's minus one and the other just two <clears throat> now, what we, what we notice about this these two solutions is they're continuous at the point where we expect to have the boundary layer. So both of them run into uh, y, have the value y equals zero at x equals zero. So in other words, if we continue these solutions in all the way into the boundary region, even though we just argued that maybe you shouldn't do that, that we have... A, a point of continuity there. So whatever transition is happening here can't be a traditional jump boundary layer. Like normally we have a situation where the if we have two outer solution regions meeting, then we would have something like this. So we're going to see this happen in the next couple examples in the last slide deck. But here, the two solutions from the outer regions meet at some point of continuity. So at best, we're not going to get a jump discontinuity. We're going to have something which is sort of a derivative discontinuity, okay? So that's what causes us to form a corner layer. Now, we need to still understand what's going on in the boundary layer. And again, this is still a review from last time, nothing new here but I did go at this pretty quickly. So I wanted to slow down and uh, go more carefully now. So as usual, we're gonna introduce a stretched variable. 
z equals x over delta, and we have to determine delta. Now, the one thing I want to say about this is normally, well, all of the previous examples we've done where we've had the boundary layer being at the left-hand endpoint, z was always a positive parameter. Z always worked out to be positive. That's because X was positive and delta is always positive. So Z was always positive in that case. Here, we're going to find that because X can be um, positive or negative, Z can also be positive or negative. So that's one thing. As usual, though, um, we define our capital Y variable to be our inner solution expansion, and that is uh, defined by uh, setting this equal to y, z delta. On all we do here is little y, in little y, we replace x with z delta according to this formula. Okay, so that's how we get our big y in the transform or capital Y variable in our transform coordinate z. Then we plug that back into the original ordinary differential equation. We transform our derivatives using the usual rules, and we get this after transforming derivatives and plugging in capital Y for little y. And now we're going to use the principle of dominant balance, as we usually do. And uh, we're going to use the principle of dominant balance in the standard way. We want to keep a second derivative in capital Y, and we want to balance this term against one of these two terms. So in other words, our choices are going to be epsilon over delta squared is going to be equal to the coefficient in front of this one or the coefficient in front of this guy. What we discover when we do dominant balance is that delta of epsilon is equal to epsilon to the one half power. And in this case, all three terms work out and balance. Now, this guy here does go to zero as epsilon or, well, I should say, this guy does eventually go to zero at the boundary layer. But we consider this as just being a standard order one parameter in front of that. Same here, an order one parameter. And so that's what gives us our balance. We're basically saying that this guy balances against the order one uh, coefficient. And you can choose either this one or this one for your balance. If you do that, then you automatically see that when I balance this guy, this whole term against order one, delta has to work out to be epsilon to the one half power. Now, what happened to the usual delta that we have in this case? Don't, don't we start, normally have a one over delta appearing here? The answer is yes, we do, but it cancels with the delta that we get on replacing this variable here, which was x, with the new z variable. So the delta variables cancel in this case. Now we see that when we find this, um, this uh, dominant balance, then all the terms are order one. This is a kind of weird situation because this is our new inner problem. None of the terms disappear whenever we plug in, uh, whenever, if we were to set epsilon to zero, okay? None of the terms disappear, so this is a bit weird. Now, we don't, usually there's an epsilon here or here, and that tells us that you probably want to do a regular solution expansion for y in terms of integral powers of epsilon. But since nothing of that kind appears here, we're left to wonder what we should do uh, for our expansion. So it turns out the right thing to do is to expand in half integral powers of epsilon. And uh, there's one tip off to why that might be the case. And that is precisely because our scale for the inner, um, the inner, uh, or I should say the, the boundary layer thickness is delta equals epsilon to the one half power. So this tips us off that maybe we need to expand in a different way than we had before. For example, if, if we found out that the boundary layer thickness was epsilon squared, then we might expand in terms of uh, integral powers of uh, k times 2. Or if epsilon, if we found out that delta was equal to epsilon over a quarter, then we would expand in powers of epsilon to k by 4. Okay. 
Now, at the end of the day, the only thing to do is just try various things and see what sticks. Okay, so this is what is, is, is going to work out for us. Now, here's the other weird thing. There's no epsilon, which appears here at all. That means that there's no recursive nature associated with forming these equations. Normally, there's an epsilon here, and so when we set epsilon to zero, this guy drops out and we'll get a recursive uh, sequence of equations. Here, we don't get any such thing. Our equations always look exactly the same. Okay, yes. What is recursive sequence? Recursive sequence means that the next term depends on what the previous terms were, okay? So for example, if I find out my uh, equation looks like this, That's a recursive sequence because this is from the previous uh, equation. That's the solution to the previous equation, right? So if you have a different boundary condition, I think uh, about f one k would to all the boundaries like all homogeneous theories. Right. So f one would be zero. Well, all I'm saying is. Yeah, I'm not saying what the pro what the boundary conditions are. They may have different boundary conditions for sure. But it's not even clear what boundary conditions we should use in this case because there's this is not connected with a physical boundary, right? So the boundary layer sits in the middle of two other outer solution regions. So the only way we can fix any uh, variable coefficients here is to do matching. And we do, we're going to have to do matching on both sides. So one, so you imagine solving a second order ODE, you're going to have two free parameters when you do that solution. And so one parameter is going to be satisfied by matching with one side and then the other parameter with the other side. Or in other words, you'll get two equations in two unknowns and should be able to solve for your free parameters. But the equation is not recursive anymore. It's simply uh, the same equation for all values of K. That means whatever we find as the solution is the same solution for all values of K. So the leading order solution uh, to that problem is exactly the same as uh, the one that we solved in the previous example, right? So in the previous example, we saw we had the same equation, only we had an epsilon in front of that. Well, it's not much of a stretch to solve exactly the same problem without the epsilon. It still involves this sort of error function expansion like this. So there's our exact solution. Previously, we used uh, the, uh, in this integral, we used the lower limit to be minus one. And that was because we were working on a domain of minus one to plus one. Here, um, the way you usually do this is you're gonna use minus infinity when you're working with the inner solution region. That's because you kind of think about Z as going from minus infinity to infinity. Now, of course, this is the same solution that you see at all uh, values of K, not just for K equals zero, but it turns out, um, well, we only need this at first, but we'll see that the same solution works for any value of K. It's, it's kind of obvious already, but let's stick with this first. Uh, leading order uh, solution at first and see where we get with this. All right, so we're gonna perform a matching to see if we can match that leading order solution of the inner solution with the leading order solutions for the outer solution, which are the, just these. This one is in the right-hand side and this one is in the left-hand side. See if we can match those two things together. So for matching, we need to, we do the same thing we usually do. We introduce an intermediate variable and it's defined as X over eta. Now the problem or the difference here is that W can be both positive or negative, the same as Z. We know that Delta, we've already found the Delta scale that's epsilon to the one half power. Uh, eta has to simply be um, in a way larger than this, than this scale. So the usual thing that we demand is that um, 
if we, so I think it usually goes like this, right? So we just say delta over eta has to go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So in other words, this guy goes to zero faster than that. And sometimes I'll just say that as this is bigger than that. Okay, so that's the shorthand for that. So um, let's try an n equals zero, m equals zero match. That's the usual lowest order match that we can possibly make. Okay, so the what we're looking for then is when we do the expansion of the outer solution by replacing x with w eta, we look for the function that's produced that uh, is larger than little o of one terms. And the same with the outer solution, or sorry, the inner problem. For the inner solution, we replace z with w eta over delta. Of course, we know what delta is in this case. And we keep all terms which are bigger than little o of one as epsilon goes to zero. And of course, you keep in mind that w can be both positive or negative, but it's not zero. So for the leading order solution, just replacing x with w eta, we get something very simple. So on the left-hand side, we get minus w eta. On the right-hand side, we get 2 w eta. There's nothing else we can do with those. They can't be expanded or anything like that. And remember, we said that this is the not just the leading order. This is essentially the asymptotic expansion for all orders. Okay, because y1 is 0, y2 is 0, and all higher orders are all 0. There's, there's, this is, this is the y0, 0 match. In fact, it's the y, n, m match for all values of n and m because there's nothing more above, above this. And moreover, it's, ex, it's exact, right? This, we're not saying this is that plus some little o of 1. No, it's just all of it, okay? There is no little o of 1 extra. Okay, there's no approximations here. There's no expansions. It just is what it is because it's already a polynomial in terms of uh, X. Does everyone get that subtlety? Now, the inner solution is a bit different and we have to pay attention in this one uh, to go to what Calvin had asked earlier, do you have to pay attention to whether you're on the left or the right-hand side? And you, you can see immediately when we deal with this guy, we will. So here's our leading order term, replacing Z with W eta over delta. Delta is epsilon to the one half, of course. And so we get all of this junk. Now, why did I get rid of this? Well, this term is transcendentally small because I think this must, yeah, this was uh, when I when I square this guy, I get W squared over, times eta squared over epsilon to leading order. Doesn't matter because this guy here is going to be transcendentally small. This one is also going to be transcendentally small because as epsilon goes to zero, eta over epsilon square root goes to infinity right? Because eta is smaller than the epsilon to the one half scale. W is a fixed number, but it's negative. So where does this go? This guy goes to minus infinity. So you can show that this is just the tail of a Gaussian, where this guy is going off to minus infinity. So this whole term is transcendentally small, okay? It's not something plus something transcendentally small. It's just all transcendentally small. So transcendentally small and same here. This goes to, this gets large, but it goes large polynomial and it's not enough to stop this freight train, which is going to zero. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this algebraic power is not enough to control this uh, transcendentally small term. So all that survives is this guy here. And notice that there's no way that we can get a match now because here are our outer solution uh, match functions. So on one hand, actually, we're just dealing with this one here. 
minus w eta. But here we have w eta over epsilon to the one half power. There's nothing in this guy, which is epsilon to the minus one half, which can balance that. Therefore, a match is not possible. Okay, so this is my match term for the inner solution region. A match is not possible because there are no terms which are going to be epsilon to the minus one half. No terms of epsilon to the minus one half here. A match is not possible. However, you can see right away that we're going to score just fine. We're, doing, we're going to do just fine when we go to the next order. Okay. That's because at the next order, well, you'll see, you'll see what happens. You'll see what happens. That's okay. So just because a match fails doesn't mean that you're going to fail to get a match in all situations. So the next possibility would be to take n equals zero, m equals one. Now, this is going to turn out to be exactly the same as, same as taking n equals one, m equals one, but uh, we don't have to worry about that level of detail. Let's take n equals zero, m equals zero. So that means we're going to keep just uh, the leading order for the outer solution, but we're going to keep the leading order and the first order correction for the inner. So the outer is the same as before. Okay. Um, and I say, I claim that the reader can show that the inner matching function is precisely this. Well, this comes from the, the analysis we just did. That was the one we claimed couldn't be matched. It's true, it can't. But now when we go to the next order, we gain this term. And why do we gain that one? Well, remember what we're doing here is we're taking Y zero capital, right? And we're replacing Z with W eta over epsilon to the one half. But we also have epsilon to the one half times Y one W eta over epsilon to the one half. Now, apart from the coefficients, which are different, these two terms are exactly the same, this guy and that guy. Remember we said that Y0, capital Y0, capital Y1, they're all the same because the equations are all the same. The only thing that differs are the coefficients, the constants, the, the unknown constants we have to match. And now, the the but, but this Y1 term is getting multiplied by epsilon to the one half power. So, the epsilon to the minus one half that would have been there gets canceled out by the epsilon to the plus one half power. And so we ultimately end up with a term like this, C10 W eta. So there was nothing really extra to do there. We know that this has to be what comes out in the end. Plus of course, TST, which we drop because that's gonna be little o of one. Now, why do we keep little o of one? Because N is equal to zero still here. This one is going to have to be little o of epsilon, uh, eps actually little o of epsilon to the one half. But remember, this was exact, doesn't have any little o terms floating around otherwise. If you follow the matching procedure that we outlined in chapter two, it's a little bit complicated, but um, so this, to get this term here, you needed plus a uh, little o of epsilon to the n power, but of course epsilon or n is equal to zero. And here it was plus little o of, um, it wasn't actually epsilon, it was phi to the m power, right? And here you just recognize, well, okay, Actually, our phi's are phi k is just equal to epsilon to the k by two. Okay, that's the scale that we're using for the inner expansion. The outer expansion is exactly the same as usual. All right. But those are details. Don't worry too much about those. This is what we get for the inner function. Okay, the inner match. And now we can match it with this guy. We're looking at the W is less than zero case here. How do we match this guy? Well, we're gonna get a match because we can say C00 is equal to zero and C10 is equal to minus one. Those two terms can then match. 
But before we get to that, let's work with the W positive term. So for W positive, we need to look at um, this full function for k equals zero and one whenever W is greater than zero. We didn't bother with this, this case for k equals zero because we already observed right away that we weren't going to get a match, so we stopped. But now we have to tackle this thing in full force. Well, this guy is still going to be uh, transcendentally small. Okay, so this is still transcendentally small. But what about this guy? Well, now W is a positive number. So this goes to the other side of zero. So what we get then is we get, well, we have to analyze this in a slightly different way. Since W is positive, what we're going to do is write this as this full Gaussian integral and then subtract off its tail. Okay, so actually this is square root of 2 pi now. So we actually do get something out plus something which is transcendentally small. So for this contribution now, we get something which is not just transcendentally small. We get 2 pi, square root of 2 pi. So that's what we're going to throw in there. Um, let's see, did I cheat a little bit? Yeah, I guess I did. So um, this one, of course, not much you can do with that. It's already algebraic. So anything which is already algebraic, you keep. Okay, or or I should say, simply just simple algebraic powers, right? Nothing you can do with that in terms of expansion. This is transcendentally small. This is square root two pi plus something transcendentally small. So what I claim is that when we do this expansion, so notice that we have leading order, first order correction, and then times epsilon to the one half, then we get all of this junk here. Okay, so uh, leading order, what is that? That's this one and that one. And then the first order correction is this guy plus that guy. Okay, and so notice I've used my two new, these are my two new coefficients, which appear. All right. Um, good. So now um, I have two different uh, expansion regions for this inner function. So whenever W is less than zero, I get this. When W is greater than zero, I get all of this. Okay, get all of that. So now this is what I'm going to try to do my matching with. Okay, so that, that captures both W po negative and positive, not just W negative as I wrote down previously. So that W negative is definitely that, but now we've captured the positive term. So all together we have this. All right, now how do we do our matching? Well, uh, we have to do the matching uh, with W positive and W negative because there are different outer solution uh, expansions according to whether we're on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So whenever we do, so we have four, or, or sorry, I should say two orders to match now. Okay, so the two orders are going to be eta over epsilon to the one half and order eta. And we have two different possibilities. We either have left, we have left and right for each one of these two cases. So we have this left, that right, order A to left, order A to right. So that gives us our four equations. We have four free parameters to deduce. If we solve everything out, we're going to find that at the lowest possible order, we should get C0, 0 equals 0. That's because there's nothing we can balance against that, that term. We have to eliminate it. So the way we do that is, well, again, so we're, we're getting this power appearing in the inner solution region or the inner solution match, but it doesn't appear in the, none of those, uh, that power doesn't appear in the outer solution match region, match function. So that means we need to make that guy go away. Now, I, I, I read through another book which did this um, expansion, and they, they simply started out with the inner solution expansion with this already set to zero. 
And it puzzled me why, how they knew that. Well, it's true that that's, that, that works and it gives you the right uh, asymptotic expansion, but you can add it, you, you can include it and then deduce from matching that it must be zero. Okay, so that's, I find is a more uh, palatable approach as far as I'm concerned. All right, we also should, because this guy here has nothing to match against, we also should find that that guy, let's see, no, that's this one. This guy here, let's see. Now, why does this guy not appear there? Uh, oh. No, sorry. It's this guy. There's nothing to balance that term. I was looking for the one which 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 was uh, something over epsilon to the one half, and I couldn't find it. But finally, yes, yeah, there. So we need to we need to ensure that this guy is zero. But of course, it has to be because there's nothing to match it on in the in the outer solution. So now, what about these terms? These are the only ones that are really going to contribute anything uh, of importance. If we balance those, then we get C1 of zero equals minus one, which is exactly what we want. And then C1 of zero plus square root two pi, C11 one one has to be equal to two, the coefficient in the outer solution matching function. So this tells us that C10 has to be equal to minus one and C11 one one has to be equal to three over the square root of two pi. And it follows that the matching function for both the inner and the outer region is the same. So for W negative, it's minus W eta, and for W positive, it's two W eta. All right, now we can put together our uniformly valid composite solution, but we have to do this in, we have to be careful about this and do it in two steps. Um, you have to put it together for the W less than zero case first and the W greater than zero case, and what you find out when you do that is you get exactly the same function on both sides. So you don't have to define this thing in terms of pieces, okay? So this answers Calvin's other question, does it really matter whether you're on the left or the right-hand side? It turns out no, because I can write one uniformly valid expansion that is valid on both sides of the, of the, the domain, both the left side and the right-hand side. So it only remains to see what the heck this thing looks like. And uh, I've shown you this picture already. For various values of epsilon, say 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001, this thing is tending, of course, to its what quote unquote sharp interface limit. And the sharp interface, of course, is going to just be the two outer solutions sort of meeting in the middle. Okay, so just notice that those two outer solutions come together, as we said before, in a continuous fashion, not a discontinuous fashion. So there's no boundary layer there in the usual sense. We don't get a jump discontinuity. Um, but there is a transition layer. It's probably better or more appropriate to call it a transition layer of the type called a corner layer. Okay, so this is what we mean by a corner layer. Any questions about that? All right, so that this answers two uh, important points. And the, the first one is, is there anything out there besides the, the standard boundary layer that we encounter in practice? And the answer is yes, we can encounter these things called corner layers. And the second question is, well, what happens whenever the P function is not positive or negative over the entire interval? In this case, we had P equals X. And it had a simple zero right in the middle of the region at x equals zero. So that, that answers the question, what happens when you have that? So the theorem that we wrote down and proved previously doesn't apply in this case. Remember that one, for that one, we demanded that p of x was greater than zero or p of x is strictly less than zero on the whole of the domain. Neither of those two conditions hold anymore with this case. So something new has to happen. And uh, so we saw what happens in a particular example. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen in every case like this, 
All right. But that's what happened in this case. There now, so let me uh, mention a couple of things that I'm not that we're not going to do in this uh, in this setting. There can be problems where you have a boundary layer at both ends. So you could have something where you have an outer solution region, which is actually in the middle. And you have two inner, two distinct inner solution regions, like say one at this boundary layer and one at this boundary layer. All right, so it can happen that you have boundary layers at both endpoints. And um, that's kind of a situation which isn't covered by our general theory either. Right, so that must be a case where. Please go away. Go ahead. All right. So this also must be a case where p is not greater than zero on the full domain, or less strictly less than zero on the full domain. Something else is going on with problems like this. So we're not going to cover that in this uh, in any of our examples. So maybe in a couple of years you can look back whenever this book is published and you'll find that example in there, but. It's not, it hasn't made it in there yet. All right, uh, questions before we move on to the last slide deck. No? Okay, so the last set of slides, you can see now why I had three slide decks. I could not quite fit this one into the uh, the second slide deck because I've got a lot of slides here. Now, really, here we're going to be looking at what happens when we have nonlinear boundary value problems, which are of uh, which are singularly perturbed. Nonlinear boundary value problems, nonlinear singularly perturbed boundary value problems, are you can imagine or can be much, much more complicated than their linear counterparts. And so that's what we're gonna discover in this case. The theory goes out the window more or less, and we have to really fly by the seat of our pants to figure out where the boundary layer is, what the boundary layer thickness is, and uh, a bunch of other questions, answer a bunch of other questions. Now, the first question you might have is, what is a nonlinear boundary value problem? Maybe uh, maybe you know what it means to be linear. Well, to be nonlinear is to be not linear. And uh, just to emphasize this, let's suppose that you're given some sort of algebraic differential operator, and let's call it O, because I don't want to nail down right now whether that's linear or nonlinear. So what does this mean? O is some kind of operator. So it could be like, uh, well, an example would be O of Y might be Y double prime of X times Y of X minus Y prime of X, right? There's a nonlinear operator. Uh, maybe it could be something like So in this case, uh, this was our standard linear operator. The only thing missing is we don't have an epsilon in front of this leading order term. Here we could put an epsilon in front of it, but the epsilon is just a parameter. It's just a number, so it doesn't really matter for our structure. So this could be, um, I say differential algebraic because it's differential in that it's, you know, you're, you're dealing with derivatives here, but algebraic in the sense that you're multiplying a derivative times the function itself. Okay, and of course we could have different coefficients in there in the mix and so on. It could be quite complicated. How about E raised to the Y comes from that non transverse? Well, um, I guess technically it's not algebraic, it's transcendental, because I I'm a little bit um I'm a little bit vague in what I mean by algebraic, but uh but 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 technically, yeah, that's the even the type of operator that I'm thinking about. So maybe I should just say just a differential operator 
or in other words, an operator that involves derivatives, but not integrals, for example. <laughs> so we say um, oper operator O is a linear differential operator. I'll drop the algebraic. If and only if it satisfies the usual linearity property. So this is the so-called linearity property. O of alpha Y1 plus beta Y2 is equal to alpha O Y1 plus beta O Y2. In other words, if I perform some sort of linear combination in the argument of the operator, then the result is some linear combination of the operator acting on Ys, okay? And this holds true or has to hold true for arbitrary functions Y, which are sufficiently smooth so that you can apply the differential operators point-wise. And of course, if this doesn't hold, then the operator is said to be nonlinear. So that means it could hold for a lot of them, but a lot of these functions Y1 and Y2, but if it fails for one pair, then it's no longer going to be linear, okay? Now, of course, if it fails for one or two pairs, then it's probably going to fail for a lot of pairs, but that's the idea. So if it fails to be linear, in other words, it's nonlinear, then one of the general tenets of our analyses leaves us. So one of the things we usually say in our analysis is, well, if you have two solutions to uh, a linear ODE, then any combination of linear combination of solutions is also a solution to the ODE. So that sort of analysis goes out the window. Whenever we're dealing with uh, second order linear ODEs, what do we know? Well, well, the solution is usually given as a linear combination of two linearly independent solutions, right? That goes out the window. Okay, so what the what is the solution structure and how many linearly independent solutions you have is completely unknown. There's no theory anymore. That's why I say nonlinear boundary value problems can have a rich variety of solutions. There's a lot of stuff that's possible, a lot of stuff that could happen. So let's get into it. The first one we want to examine is this nonlinear singularly perturbed boundary value problem. It consists of the ordinary differential equation shown here on the domain x between 0 and 1. And just for definiteness, we're, we're going to fix the boundary conditions to be at x equals 0, y is equal to minus 1, and x equals 1, y is equal to plus 1. So this problem is studied uh, at length in this book by Kevorkian and Cole. In fact, it's quite famous for their analysis. I find their analysis so impenetrable, though, as to be almost um, useless on first glance. So if you want to know what's going on with this problem, read my lecture notes first and then go to Kevorkian and Cole and see once you have an understanding of kind of what's going on for a specific case, then you can go and look at Kevorkian and Cole and see what's going on in the full general case. The reason why it's so impenetrable is because they try to abstract it way too quickly. So pedagogically, if you abstract something way too much, then it's hard to learn from it. So that's why I chose specific boundary conditions. In Kevorkian and Cole, they start off by saying, let the right, right, left-hand boundary condition just be A and the right-hand boundary condition just be B, where B, A and B are unknown. Uh, and so it becomes very difficult to understand what the heck's going on. Now, how are we going to figure out what solution should look like, where the boundary layer is, what's going on with this problem? The problem here is that uh, is is this term right here, right? So normally, if this is a an ODE, an ordinary differential equation that was linear, then this wouldn't be allowed, right? This is multiplying the function values of y times its derivative values. So this operator is no longer linear. We don't know anything about it. Now you might look at this and say, well, okay. Let's imagine that that was a P of X. Then we would know that this has a boundary a, a boundary layer at um, X equals zero, 
as long as y is positive and if y is negative on the entire interval, then it would be have a boundary layer at the right-hand endpoint. But that's kind of foolish talk because we don't even know what the solution looks like. How can we say it's positive everywhere? So we need to use something else to kind of understand what's going on here. How many of you have heard of what's called a phase portrait before? Phase portrait. Um, it's usually used to understand the structure of ordinary differential equations, which look like this. So a system of two ordinary differential equations, which are coupled together. But you can actually use them to understand second order autonomous ordinary differential equations of this type, which I'll show you in a moment. So since OD1 is a second order autonomous nonlinear equation, we can make use of the phase portrait to understand where the boundary layer should be. So to do this, we're gonna do uh, two things. The first one is we're gonna introduce a new dependent variable called U, which is equal to Y prime. So U is equal to Y prime. And then the next one is, is not fundamental. It's more or less uh, for historical reasons. You change the spatial variable x to a temporal variable t, okay? Change the spatial variable x to a temporal variable t. That's because we're thinking about a dynamical systems approach. And in a dynamical systems approach, the independent variable is usually t. All right, now the second order equation, one can then be re-expressed in the following first, as a first order system, as, as it's not too hard to see. So if y, or sorry, if u is equal to y prime, right, then this equation here is obvious. This equation is obvious, right? That's just restating what we said there. Well, what about this equation? This says u prime of t is equal to all this. Remember, if we take u, if we take the time derivative of u, that's going to be the second derivative of y. So this is just saying the second derivative of y is equal to one over epsilon times all that. But all that is just this stuff here and move to the right-hand side of the equation and then divide by epsilon. Okay, so this becomes u prime. I take everything else and move it to the other side. This is just u here because u is equal to y prime. And then I, I move this stuff to the right-hand side and divide by epsilon, and I get exactly this expression. All right, so the phase portrait is shown on the next page, but let's, before we get to that, let's just say one thing. Um, let's pair this system with some initial conditions. We want at y, or x equals zero, y to be equal to minus one. Well, why is that one chosen? Why is that one chosen? Well, that one is chosen because of this boundary condition here. But now we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about a system which is uh, a dynamical system now, okay? So let's think about that as a solution. So suppose that the first equation actually has a solution. So that first equation, it's uh, at x equals zero, it's minus one, right? So that looks something like this down here. And at uh, x equals one, it's plus one. So the solution is going to look something like this. Come along. Something like that. All right. Um, and actually, that is what the solution is going to look like. So that at uh, x equals zero, this value up here is gonna be plus one and down here at x equals, sorry, being dyslexic right now, x equals one there and here's x equals zero. x equals zero, we're gonna have minus one. Now, what we can think about, I can view this as what's called a shooting problem. Has anyone ever heard of the shooting method? So the shooting method, you think about starting here with the value Oh my goodness, minus one. And I think about the derivative as being a variable. So I could start out at minus one with that derivative or that derivative value, 
this derivative value, maybe I could go flat, right? And it's like shooting a gun or a ballistics problem where you uh, you have a cannon on a hill and you give an elevation for the muzzle of the cannon. That's the slope of the that's the slope of the cannon, okay, or the slope of the muzzle. But the position of the cannon is fixed. Okay, so that's why it's called the shooting method. So that is the initial slope, right? Think about it. U is equal to Y prime. So U at zero is my initial slope. If I choose exactly the right initial slope, you can imagine what happens is I travel along here, travel along here, and I hit exactly my target. So there's one slope such that when I choose that slope, if because all these trajectories are, are we can show using dynamical systems uh, theory that all these trajectories are uniquely defined. So once you pick them, once you have the point value and the slope, then you stay on one trajectory. You don't hop trajectories. What if you have a saddle point nearby? <laughs> a saddle point nearby, yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah, they have like manifold elements. Never hit not allow you to hit the, the, the yeah yeah that's true so you could run into a, a, a and we'll and we'll see that in this problem actually but in any case let's imagine we do we're we're imagining to start with we have a solution okay so that means if we choose the right slope the one and only one right slope we're going to hit the target okay so you can see that this new problem can be thought of as being equivalent to the original problem right now here's the phase portrait. Here's the phase portrait. So Y is this direction here, and U its slope is this direction here. There's no T uh, variable on this portrait at all, okay? And that's because as I travel along a trajectory, I tick away some time, tick, 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 okay? So for example, take this red curve. This red curve is ultimately gonna turn out to be the solution curve. As you go along this red curve, so I'm at y equals minus one. See, the minus one is there. And I have a slope, which is just a little bit above u equals one. And if I start at just the right slope, I go this way. I cross here at exactly x equals one half, or t equals one half. And then I go back down. And I cross, come back down here to y equals plus one. Now let's think about that. We said we're pairing this with different choices of the slope. We're pairing that with a y zero being minus one. So that means if we choose y zero to be minus one, here's the set of all y zero point or well, y equals minus one points. So right there. It's that line there. In fact, it goes above and below that. So let's see if I can get a nice, uh, nice. Well, here, here we go. I know how to do this. Sometimes getting it to be exactly parallel is a bit difficult. All right. So there's the y equals minus one. Oh, come, come on back. Nope. There we go. There's the y equals minus one line. So choosing a different slope means you're starting on this line, but you're starting with a different height in u. So for example, if I choose that as my height and I go across here, I end up going on a curve like that. Now the question is, do I end up over here? Let's, let's take this guy and copy him. Copy, paste. Okay, the question is, do I precisely end up at y equals plus one after ticking away exactly one unit of time? That's the question. Do I end up over there after ticking away exactly one unit of time? Well, if I go on this curve, I claim that you do exactly that. After one tick on the clock, one second, you go exactly and hit y equals plus one. But what if I start here? 
Well, it turns out if I start there, I go too fast and go too far. Okay, that one has a higher velocity. Y is also can be interpreted as the velocity. So if I start with a higher velocity, I kind of go too fast. And after one tick of the clock, I end up somewhere over here, too far. So that slope was too big. What if I take a slope which is negative? Okay, well, I start here and actually I go, turns out, that way. That's That says that the Y values are getting smaller and smaller, right? That's not what I want. I want the Y values to grow from minus one up to plus one, not get smaller and smaller. So that trajectory looks something like that. Y gets more and more negative. Can it come back? No. You can prove that it doesn't come back. Why do I keep doing that? There we go. This one cannot come back because it can't cross with any of these. And you can show that these are all parabolic arcs. So it can't ever come back. It always just gets more and more negative in Y. Oh, uh, let's see. What if I start just here, just below U equals one? What happens in that case? Well, you go something like this. Now these velocities are too slow to get you there in time. So you might only go part of the way over. And as Calvin said, you might actually get into, you might head into what's called the stable manifold, okay? So if I'm on what's called the stable manifold, I'll go through this thing called a fixed point right here. What happens if, if you go onto the stable manifold is that suddenly you run into what's called the unstable manifold and it kicks you back out, which that's that guy right there. Okay. So that's what happens in that case. In fact, in that case, if you go into the stable manifold, you actually end up just here. So what I'm what I'm describing is if you're just below that, you go like that. Okay. If you're on the stable manifold, you're going to go in, hurl into the fixed point, and you kind of never I think it's uh, the case where you just never get there. Now, if I'm just above that, then I go like that, and I don't quite get there on t equals one. So t equals one unit of time. So the one I want is this red curve because it ticks away just perfectly so that I get over here after t equals one second, all right? Now, what are all these different curves showing? The different curves are showing that if I start at different locations in the y, u plane, so this was, you start with a different slope, or sorry, a different value of y and a different slope, and then you tick away any number of seconds, you stay on a certain trajectory. And once you get onto a trajectory, you never hop onto any other trajectories because trajectories are unique, except for these weird places where you end up with what's called a fixed point. These are kind of special. All right, does everybody understand what's happening here? So the phase plane is telling us a lot about the structure of the solution. Remember, we have to start with y equals minus one and end up in after one tick of the clock, one second. Okay, I have to end up on this purple curve over here, somewhere on this purple curve, where y is equal to plus one. And now the face plane is symmetric. It has perfect mirror symmetry about this line, uh, y equals zero, or in other words, the u-axis. So that means that if I start over here and I go to this point in say, capital T over two seconds, then if I continue along the other part of that branch in T over T capital T over two seconds, I, I trace out exactly the mirror image. So that's always the case. If I start here and I and I traveled, let's say three seconds to get here, the same three seconds is going to get me to the mirror image point over here. Okay, because I always have this mirror symmetry in the in the pace plane. Notice that if I start down here at y equals plus one, then I can travel along curves which look like this to get to y equals minus one, but I can't go the other way, okay? I can't start on this curve and go backwards. The flow is only in, a, in one direction 
on, on, a, on a solution trajectory. If you want to get from minus one over to plus one, you have to start above this line y equals plus one. Okay. If you want to get there in exactly one one time unit, because you can get there if you go just below, but it takes too long. That might be two seconds. And if I start above this red line, it get there way too fast. Okay. So there's one there's one Goldilocks curve, and that's that one right there. There's one and only one Goldilocks curve, it turns out in this case. So this represents exactly one possible solution for my, my problem. And this is the one we want to model. Okay. It turns out this curve also tells us that we're going to have a boundary layer right at the midpoint for our time travel. So the travel that we're going to go is if it takes a half second to go this far, it takes another half second to go all the way across. That means that here at time equals a half, which is the same as X equals a half, we're going to have a boundary layer. We're going to have a boundary layer. What happens in the boundary layer? Well, what happens is you have a rapid, kind of a rapid increase in your slope. Okay. And then you get a slope, which goes back to basically one. So that's exactly what I've drawn here. You start off with a slope, which is close to one, just a little bit bigger. You go along, you have a rapid increase in your slope. That means your U value is getting high. And then you start to come back down to a U value, which is close to one again. So that's why we know the boundary layer occurs here, or this point here on our trajectory corresponds to this boundary layer here, okay? Now, this value for epsilon isn't that big. If I made epsilon really uh, small, or I should say this value of epsilon is not very small. If I make it really small, what do you suppose happens? Well, these guys really go up and really come back down. So the boundary layer, that means that the slope gets really large near t equals a half, okay? So that means the slope gets nearly sharp. That's exactly what's happening there, okay? So the value when t is one half, y is finer, but it's the relative is... Yeah, y is close to zero, right? So do we also know immediately that um, y one half is actually a set of one? So, okay, so first of all, your first question is y finite as you're going through that boundary layer. The answer is y is exactly zero on this line. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's exactly, even if this is really high, if U is really high, Y is still controlled, it's just zero, right? So what was your second question? So we know that Y is one half is zero. And we also- You mean T, T equals T, a half. When, 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 when the time is one half, uh, the Y value is zero. Yes. And we also know that- It's because of the mirror symmetry that we know that, uh, I keep, uh, Okay, we know because of the mirror symmetry that T is gonna be a half in the middle if I go all the way across in one time unit. And also know that we, we know that one over U is zero, which means U prime, U which is Y prime is infinity, right? Yeah. So we know that that point is a uh, point of inflection. Let's see, so point of inflection, right. So it has to be a point of inflection uh, uh, so the point of inflection is where the slope of U is flat, right? Well, even this type of point of inflection. Uh, okay. Could be. Could be. I'm not following 100%, but yeah, I think I think I get it. Does anyone, everyone understand what's going on with the, the face portrait? T gives you a lot of information tells you exactly where you need to look for things. So now not every nonlinear equation can be converted into a phase portrait like this. So that, that much is clear. Only so-called autonomous equations. Now, well, let's remind ourselves, what's an autonomous equation? Does everyone, anyone know what the definition is? It means that there are no extraneous functions of x floating around. The only places where you see x appearing are, are as arguments to y, y functions, y and its derivatives. That's what we mean by autonomous. Okay. 
The good news is most physical models of reality are autonomous because the system isn't affected by outside things going on. It's really, if I take a bunch of particles in a box and the particles are only affected by each other, then the forces are derived by the positions and the velocities of the particles. All that matters is the positions and the velocities of the particles themselves. And there's no external influences. Now, if you put an external electromagnetic field on it, which is time bearing, and you put that in as a parameter, then that could be like, oh, this, uh, that's something like a P of X here. That becomes non-autonomous, okay? There are other forces exterior to the box which are acting on it. But this, this model is autonomous and can be convert because it's second order can be converted to this uh, first order system of autonomous equations, which can be converted or studied in the phase plane. All right. Now, so the original problem, as I, I've said, a lot of these words already, so I'll just go through them. The original problem can be satisfied if we can find an initial slope such that after exactly one time unit, one unit of time, y is equal to uh, one. I should have a comma after this. After one unit of time, comma, y is equal to one. In other words, what we want is y at time t equals one to be equal to, to one. Now you can't just look at a phase plane analysis or phase plane and see that. Um, you can deduce various things by saying, okay, well, the velocity up here is faster than the velocity, is greater than the velocity down here, et cetera. Um, and so you can deduce these sort of things, but until you do one simulation, you don't know what, you know, how long it takes to get across the phase plane. Now observe that Y equals one is what's called an invariant line. That means if we get on that line, we have to stay on that line forever. You get stuck on the invariant line. And there's a good reason for that. The reason is because there's a trivial solution to this ordinary differential equation. Notice that if y is equal to x, let's see, plus b, then it solves this ordinary differential equation, okay? y equals x plus b solves that ordinary differential equation. And the way you can show yourself that is just plug that into this equation and you'll see you get zero equals zero. First of all, second derivative, that's just gonna be zero. This guy is gonna be this times the derivative of that, but that's just one. So you essentially I get y minus itself, that's zero. So if I stay, if I have a solution which can satisfy this, and that could satisfy the boundary conditions. I'm just going to stay on the invariant line for all times. Okay, so that's the invariant line. You never get off of it. It's like purgatory. This point, y u equals zero zero is what's called a saddle point. It's the intersection of what's called a stable manifold, which comes in like this, and an unstable manifold, which goes off like that. It's a special point. Um, if you're really on the stable manifold, you really do go to the fixed point and you just stay there. But it's called unstable point because if you just get slightly away from it, you're going to, if you I, I get slightly to this side of that fixed point, I immediately go down that way. Okay. Or if I get slightly over here, then I go up that way. You always are going to follow a solution trajectory. Around the unstable point, you're always going to, if you just get pushed off by a little bit, you fall off and go, in this case, off to infinity. You get, a, you get a, a free ride off to infinity. All right, um, what else? If uh, u of zero is equal to one, we stay on the invariant line and the slope of y, that is u equals y prime is always one, right? That's what it means to stay on the invariant line. So this can't be a solution to our original problem because if our, if our initial slope is one, we stay on that. All right, now u naught cannot be significantly less than one either. Why is that true? Because if we're significantly less than one, we automatically go that way. 
So that's not going to work for us. If u is negative, then we're down here and we go that way as well. So what we want is we want to be in this Goldilocks region near u equals one. And just like I said, if you're just below it, you're going to go this way. That's too slow because the velocities are too slow getting you there. And this one is just right. This one would be too fast. This one's way too fast. And you go, you go too far. This one below it doesn't get you far enough, but there's one which gets you just at the right spot. So that's what that's what all of this says. Okay. Basically, you want to stay just near, uh, just slightly above, slightly larger than one. And that's that's the red curve. Okay. All right. So um the, the other points that you can read off from the phase diagram, I also mentioned um, we're going to expect to have a boundary layer of t equals one half, which is the same as x equals one half, because I just cosmetically changed that. And uh, the slope is largest at the boundary layer. And that's also clear from this as, right, as well, right? So slope is largest on the solution at the, at the boundary layer point. Okay, so that's what this, uh, that's what the true solution looks like. So I actually did uh, a numerical calculation, but the numerics would only work for modest values of epsilon. I couldn't dial epsilon down too far because the numerics get really unstable. You have to use a really high order method to get accurate numerical results. So it turns out in this case, the only way to get a really accurate depiction of the solution is to use asymptotic methods. So. This is one of those cases where you could say, oh, you should always use numerics. Numerics are cheaper. They're easier. You don't have to study, you know, how, how it took us several weeks to figure out how to do this, right? Uh, well, it turns out that your numerics probably won't work. Okay. All right. So um, that's where we'll end today. The next time we're going to pick up with this. And so we learned a lot from the phase plane. Now we're going to do our usual thing. We're going to do outer expansions, inner expansions, and then we're going to match them. All right. Any questions before we go? I think I'm right. If you look at a graph, it's a bend, like the graph on the, on the previous one. Which one's a saddle point? Like the, the point of index at zero. Right. Um, oh, yeah, you'll have to come up and show me afterwards. I'm not I'm not following 100%. So you're too deep for me, Calvin. <laughs> Any any other questions from online? If not, I'll see you guys um, next time. Have a nice day.